Tonight on Greater Boston, with protests raging all over Iran over the death of a young woman after she was taken into police custody for wearing a headscarf improperly, could this be a game changer? Two experts in Iranian policy and protest, including a victim of the Iranian morality police herself, they join me. Then debating the possible return of happy hour to Massachusetts, State Senator Lydia Edwards and restaurateur Philip Frateroli will lay out the cases why discounted drinks should or should not be an option after a 38-year statewide ban. Despite major government crackdowns in Iran, mass protests are well into their second week over the death of 22-year-old Masa Amani. So with rumors of the Supreme Leader's failing health, could this be a true turning point for the nation? Amini died in northern Tehran hospital earlier this month, three days after being taken into custody by the so-called morality police, who accused her of violating dress codes. The police story? She suffered a heart attack from a pre-existing condition. But her family, and clearly many others, have serious questions. In response to the protest and widespread images being shared of women removing and burning their hijabs, headscarves. Iran's government has blocked internet access and social media platforms across the country. Nearly 80 people have been killed, hundreds have been arrested, including several journalists since protests began. Will they lead to real change? I'm joined by Tara Sonnenschein, former Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy under Barack Obama, who's now a professor of practice at the Fletcher School at Tufts, and Pardis Madhavi, provost of the University of Montana and the author of Passionate Uprisings, Iran's Sexual Revolution. Pardis, Tara, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Tara, if I can start with you, is the death of Amini a game changer? Meaning, will it be looked back on as a moment like that street vendor in Tunisia who self-immolated, which led to both the revolution there and the Arab Spring? Will it be? We hope so, but this has been a 40-year struggle, and we know the ups and downs of uh, these uprisings and then harsh, harsh punishment. I think what may be different here is that this is not just women. These are men and boys coming out. It's a generational struggle. And we have an 83-year-old Ayatollah and a very conservative president. So this is going to be hard, but I do think there is some momentum here. And it has lasted a bit longer than even the best experts thought it would. Pardis, is this different this time? I, I think it is different this time. I think, you know, as, as Tara mentioned, what you're seeing today is a much larger and more widespread coalition in more than 55 different cities. Um, you're seeing young and old. Certainly this is led by the youth movement, both young men and women. Um, but you're also seeing um, a breaking down of the urban-rural divide. You're seeing uh, increasingly numbers of frustrated Iranians throughout the country uh, speaking up and out against uh, the regime. But Tara, why is it different? I understand you're both describing objectively how it is different and how it's more inclusive, more widespread. But why is it that way this time? Just <laughs> mad as hell and I can't take it anymore kind of thing? Well, social media plays a role. Yeah. Um, in the past, there's been really a, an attempt to black out any information. I think more information is seeping through to people's cell phones and word of mouth. I think also we're in a time in the world where women and girls, we've been in this struggle for a very long time. I think there's a sense of fighting for your rights mm -hmm. and empowerment here. Again, though, we have to be careful. The Iranian president's going to go on television and is going to threaten decisive action and going to make it very clear that those who continue this uh, will be met with force. There will be pro-government rallies. So this is far from over, but our voices now inside and outside the country really matter. I want to talk about outside the country in a minute, but Pardis, describe to people what the morality police, who they are, and you would obviously know, because as I read in the Washington Post, you had firsthand experience as a victim of the morality police. Who are they? 
Absolutely. So the morality police are an arm of the police that were created uh, when the Islamist regime came to power after the Iranian revolution. Their charge technically is to commit and ensure right and forbid wrong. That is the, the charge that has been defined for them. Their scope uh, includes policing moral behaviors. Given that the regime, the Islamist regime, came to power under a fabric of morality, you know, in, during the revolution, they came to power um, by by uh, on a platform that was opposed to what they were calling West toxication or the loose morals of the West. And so, an entire arm of the police was created to walk the streets of Iran and, uh, on occasion, raid parties parties ensuring that Iranian citizens were comporting with proper morality uh, rules as defined by, for example, headscarves that revealed only what is called the oval part of the yeah. face um, uh, and, and other moral uh, uh, rules. Pardis, before we leave this, you were teaching a class in what, sexual politics in Tehran 15 years ago. Can you share briefly with people what happened to you? <laughs> So I was actually giving a lecture on uh, my book, which was looking at what young people termed a sexual revolution in Iran. And um, 13 minutes into my lecture, uh, I was taken off stage, pulled off stage forcibly by the morality police um, and, and, and taken in. And of course, as, as you know, I wrote in my Washington Post piece, um, suffered at the hands of their brutality as well. You know, uh, Tara, in the piece that uh, your colleague here uh, Pardis wrote, she quotes what a saying that was on walls throughout Iran from Ayatollah Khomeini, which said, the Islamic Republic is not about fun, it's about morality. There's no fun to be had in the Islamic Republic of Iran. For women in particular, fun is a very dangerous thing in Iran, no? Yes, I was in Iran in the 1980s when I was with ABC News Nightline, and mm -hmm. I came in full Shador. I was very careful. Um, it's a fear-inspiring atmosphere. Fun is so far from the reality of daily life when people are just held to account for what you wear in the morning, your blue suit, your tie, your shirt. That will define your freedom to move around, your hair, your bangs. It, it's, it's so hard for women in 2022 to even imagine yeah. that this could be a form really of holding people hostage. So Tara, staying with you, you wrote in your piece in The Globe that the West has historically been slow to react when the Iranian people have the courage to stand up to this kind of sickness. Uh, providing space for crackdowns, obviously. We know the President of the United States has spoken out in support of the protest. I think it was yesterday that Secretary of State Blinken said that he would work to ensure that, well, I guess what he called technical or technological help, I assume he means access to the Internet, would be provided. I assume those are good things by your standard. Are they enough? Their improvements. Um, in 2009, um, I think many of us were disappointed when there was an opportunity again to provide aid and comfort to protesters. This time, I think we will see more sanctions, and sanctions do bite in Iran. They do most definitely create economic difficulties. I also think the cell technology support will enable the free flow of information. And it's a cat and mouse game with the internet. People get on, they get taken off. They get on, yeah. they get off. And we need to lengthen the amount of time they have to be on those cell phones and find each other. Pardis, what, what else do you think uh, the United States and people believe in freedom should be doing to support the protesters? I think that one of the most important things that also makes it different this time is I think people need to realize this is not just a feminist issue or not just an issue for about women or women and girls. This is a human rights issue, right? I think that one of the things folks are now seeing is that whether you're a feminist or not, whether you fall into that silo here in the United States, this is a much larger issue uh, about, about human rights um, and, and freedom. And you see that in the powerful chants 
that uh, folks are are screaming on the streets of Iran today. You know, Tara, uh, you were uh, in your one of your responsibilities as Under Secretary of State was uh, public affairs. So the following is right up your alley. I don't know if you heard Steve Inskeep on NPR yesterday interviewing Iran's foreign minister. And when Inskeep uh, asked if he felt the protesters had legitimate reasons for protest, here's what the uh, Iranian foreign minister said in response. Something happened to her that made all of us very sad. Similar incidents happen all around the world, like tons of examples similar to that in the United States or the UK. What's the appropriate response to that for the US to have credibility in this matter? The appropriate response is no moral equivalence. What is happening in Iran is unlike anything that happens in the West. I think what it shows is Iran's crisis of legitimacy, that they have to now try to walk back a bit, try to equate Iran's behavior with the UK or the US. This is the moment that women around the world, men, boys, your program and others, have to stay at this day in and day out. The messaging, the words matter, the narrative matters. We just cannot look sideways or look away from this. One last thing, Pardis, uh, as I'm sure you know, I'm not sure everybody watching knows, the United States has tried to get the Iran nuclear deal back in place. Talks apparently broke off, but there's still a desire on the part of the United States to uh, reimpose the, that agreement or renegotiate that agreement. Is continuing that negotiations a help or a hindrance to the effort of people on the streets of Iran? You know, I, I think that the issue is going to be this question of the legitimacy of the regime, right? And so, you know, having the United States continue to engage in the regime, you know, does that, as Tara said a moment earlier, does that legitimize then the regime? Are there ways in which the United States can support, you know, the, the more organic movements that we're now seeing in the street? Um, I think that's something that we need to take a good hard look at. Uh, at the same time, as I've been following um, the, the talks around the U.S.-Iran nuclear deal, one of the things that we're seeing and scholars around the country here are, are talking about is that the deal is, is appearing um, quite different than, you know, when John Kerry was initially brokering it. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to take a hard look at why, um, why the deal has changed so significantly um, in these past few years. Tara, can you take the last 15 seconds and weigh on on that too, please? Yes, I mean, during the time when we had Soviet dissidents, we still managed to negotiate arms control mm -hmm. um, with Soviets. And we cordoned off, we compartmentalized. We did what we could though to keep our eyes on the human rights. And yes, we will negotiate nuclear treaties and we will do economic sanctions but at this moment in time we stand with the people of iran and their expressions of frustration rage and resentment and what's been four decades of unfair treatment tara sonenshine pardis madhavi thank you both for your time and your work we really appreciate it thank you for the umpteenth time since the happy hour ban was enacted in Massachusetts 38 years ago by my guest of last week, by the way, former Governor Dukakis, after a string of deadly drunk driving accidents, the debate over discounted drinks is returning to the state and kicking up again. And while Governor Charlie Baker is throwing cold water on the idea, many bar and restaurant patrons are still pushing for the change. Senate passed the plan in an economic development bill in July with language that would let cities and towns opt in to allow discounted drink specials. The House has yet to weigh in, but as for the governor, well, here's what he told us on Boston Public Radio this past Monday. Maybe this is just me being, you know, an old fuddy-duddy, but um, I think most... I think most places do just fine based on the um, based on the current rules as they are. The simple truth of the matter is, um, people got overserved a lot in the old days, and I believe people will continue to get overserved. And there are consequences associated with that. And the consequences, in many cases, I don't think justify or are worth the benefit that's associated with you know, 25-cent drinks. You'd veto this thing, right, if it uh, gets you? Most likely, yeah. 
I'm joined now by State Senator Lydia Edwards, who co-sponsored the Happy Hour Amendment, and Philip Frateroli, owner of Ducale and Ristorante Lucia and Cunard Tavern. Phil, Senator, good to see you both. Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity. You know, Phil, starting with you, many people, and I have to say, including me, just automatically assume, particularly after the pain that restaurants and bars suffered during COVID, that all restaurants would be all into this. You are not. Why? Well, we just feel like, um, you know, the speed consumption of alcohol is irresponsible. So by putting this forward and putting the onus on restaurants to either adopt this or lose out on a potential economic development or an economic um, surge, we, we just feel like it's not necessary. It's, this is a, um, a dinosaur, a, a, a relic of the past. And the, to call it economic development for us in the, in the, in the inflationary period and in the crisis that we are in right now after two years of, of the pandemic, we just think there's other things that the Senate and the, and the House could be doing to help us. And, and one of those things is reforming the ABCC regulations around outdoor dining. That's something that was great that came out of the pandemic and, and stands to go away as soon as some of these um, the executive orders uh, end next year. You know, my understanding, a Senator, is from the, the Mass Restaurant Association that Phil is not an outlier, that the majority of bar and restaurant owners agree with his position. Why would you sponsor this? Uh, because I think a majority of people in Massachusetts uh, want an option uh, and want to be able to have this as something fun to do. I, th I think, you know, the fact is I'm sponsoring an opportunity for cities and towns to make up their own minds. So if this doesn't work in Boston, if this doesn't work in Cambridge, it may work in Fitchburg or places where there may not be as economically as advanced or as benefited as uh, some of our restaurants in Boston. There, This is a statewide ban that I think needs to be broken up. And I think locally, cities and towns can come up with their own version of what makes sense for happy hour or, or decline to do it. We did this exact same thing when it came to cannabis. There were some cities and towns who simply said, we don't want it. They don't have it. Well, how about the response to that, Phil? I'd take it one step further. Not only is there an option for a city or town not to opt in, but obviously, even if Boston, for example, opted in, doesn't require you to do anything. You can continue to not have happy hours. So why not give other restaurants in your community the option to do what they would think might be best for them? Well, I think that this is, I mean, you're looking at the state as a whole and uh, Boston and Cambridge, those are urban communities where people are like, less likely to be driving. They're more likely to be taking public transit. When you talk about Fitchburg and other cities and towns where the majority of people are going to be driving, let's look at the public safety aspect of this. We're, we're encouraging them to drink as much as possible, as fast as possible, and sending them out on the roads. Like, what, who does that benefit? And if a, it's a restaurant around me or all the restaurants around me decide that they want to participate in this and they start giving out alcohol for pennies on the dollar, I'm, I'm going to be at a disadvantage relative to those people, especially in, in a staffing crisis that we're in. I mean, my bartenders, they're, they're not as concerned about the impact on the business. They want to see that the tip money come into their pockets. So I might lose out on staff. I might lose out on opportunities that I, I wouldn't otherwise have because I took a stand on something that isn't really good for anybody except for the person looking to save a couple bucks and get blasted. Phil, I want to stay with you for one second, though. Uh, I don't know if Senator Edwards did this, but other sponsors of the bill, her colleagues, have and supporters of the bill in the legislature have talked about the fact that when Governor Dukakis banned this, there was no such thing as ride sharing. There was no Uber and Lyft option. And I have to say, from my personal experience, the attitude I had about drunk driving 38 years ago, or driving at least after I had a drink, is dramatically different thanks to Mothers Against Drunk Driving, thanks to people like Ron Bersani, who lobbied for Melanie's Law, which was named after his granddaughter, who was killed by a drunk driver. Isn't this a totally different world on this issue 38 years after the fact? Sorry, my baby was asleep for about half an hour. That's oh, okay. Just That's perfectly okay. Do we have a second? Um, I would say, yeah, but I think we are in a different world. But at the same time, I don't think drunk driving has gone away as a problem. I think the opposite would be, be true. I think we still have problems with 
with people uh, operating under the influence, whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever it is. So to think that we're at, that Uber or in Lyft saves society from these ills, I think is a little bit simplistic. Well, um, if, if I may, Senator, beyond Phil's argument that it's simplistic, when I was thinking, when I listened to the governor say the other day, he didn't think the Uber and Lyft thing solved the problem either. I thought about it after the show and I said, it seems to me the people who are most likely to responsibly take an Uber or a Lyft if they had too much to drink are not the people we're worried about. It's the people who've had too much to drink who aren't responsible enough to take an Uber and a Lyft and are much more likely to do something that can lead to great danger for others and themselves. How do you respond to that? Let's get the senator's response if we can, please. Yeah, I mean, we we don't make all of our policies, every single one of our policies, based on the fact that there are a few bad actors. I mean, if you want to just stop people from drinking outside and publicly, you can also just ban alcohol sales altogether. I mean, if you want to be very clear, there are people who have an issue with alcoholism. There are people who mm -hmm. overdrink right now, happy hour isn't going to encourage more people to become alcoholics if they aren't already. If they're responsible drinkers, they'll be responsible drinkers. And I think, you know, we just can't talk about the economic benefits of some restaurants. There's some very small restaurants that would love to have some business on a Monday night that they never would get. And maybe having a modified version of what is happy hour, and it doesn't have to be pennies on the dollars. We can come up with a system that is economically responsible, but also encourages people to turn off after a certain amount of alcohol. This is, it's not a free for all. Uh, it is, I don't know, I, maybe because I went to uh, undergrad and uh, grad school in a different state that had happy hours and it was uh, something to do after work and then you went home. And this is not, I, I, I don't know, I think there's a, there's a real mis, uh, disconnect of what exactly is happy hour, how it works and who goes to it. It's mostly people coming right after work and they go, enjoy, and then move on um, for the rest of their evening. But you can't deny that it, if you're a, a recent graduate and you're not making a ton of dough, Senator, the likelihood of you having a second or a third drink is probably greater when they're cheap than when they're not, no? True, and the likelihood of me going out is also greater. The yeah. likelihood of me sporting local restaurants is also likely yeah. greater. These are all benefits that come along with a version of happy hour, and again, making it a local option, allowing for cities and towns and down to the restaurant to be able to design it, what's best for them, is the safest option. Phil, I'm running low on time. I interrupted you. Did you want to say something before about the Uber and Lyft thing? Uh, in, in, in response to what the governor said, I think, that, I mean, the people that are being attracted by lower pricing might be less likely to jump in an Uber and they might be more likely yeah. to drive themselves. I mean, I was 20, I lived, when I was in my 20s, I lived in New York, I loved happy hour. I wish I could go back to the days where I had no responsibilities and could do that, but just because it's fun doesn't mean it should be brought back. You know, before you two go, uh, the first thing that Phil said here is he'd prefer the legislature spend time on something like allowing restaurants to do outdoor dining, which was one of the huge benefits financially, I think, and as a consumer and customer, a huge joy for people like me. Why hasn't the legislature address that issue and made it a permanent option for restaurants if they choose to do it, outdoor dining, that is. I think the conversation is still going on, first of all, on outdoor dining. I don't think we still are hopeful to come back and continue our conversation on the economic development bill. So I'm, it's not a matter of it not being part of the legislature's mindset and possible conversation in terms of permanent solutions. But again, another area where Phil and I do disagree to a certain extent is how outdoor dining has been rolled out where it should be rolled out, and whether every single neighborhood um, has been able to handle it appropriately. So I, I, I guess when I think about this, um, we've allowed outdoor dining to be something that goes down to the restaurant level in certain circumstances certain circumstances for them to determine what is safest. There's traffic issues, there's um, uh, drinking mm -hmm. issues, there were concerns. We've allowed all of these local economy, economic issues to happen at the restaurant level. I think uh, happy hour should be a part of that conversation as well. Well, you're both gonna be back quickly to discuss that one because that's a huge one with me. Phil Frateroli, Senator Edwards, I really appreciate your time. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for tonight. Please come back tomorrow. Local journalist Susan Zalcon joins me on her new Hulu documentary, The Murders Before the Marathon, about an unsolved triple homicide in Waltham, which she believes, if solved, could have prevented the 2013 marathon bombing. Plus, the dropkick Murphy's Ken Casey on his expanding taco empire. 
That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the first installation of Season 2 of GBH News Curiosity Desk. Please don't forget Ukraine nor the Iranian protesters.